I'm just going to read before Paul comes and uh, explains the next passage into Ephesians 3. 4 even. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> Ephesians 4 we'll go to. Uh, starting at the beginning. The first 16 verses of Ephesians 4. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you are called to one hope when you are called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ appointed it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists and others to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until all of us reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love, as each part does its work. Christine didn't mention this morning that the unfortunate thing about her violin was that Compostano died the year before 1711. <laughs> uh, we ended chapter one that God placed all things under Christ's feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the sake of the church. It's all for the church. Because the church is his body. End of chapter one. The fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So, what is Christ's desire for his church? That's a good question, isn't it? What does he want for the church? And in chapter 4 we hear some of the answers. Now there is so much here, we're only going to have time to scratch the surface. But can I point out to you the melodic line? Christian maturity, a grown-up church, is the melodic line. It's there in verse 12. Just look at it. So that the body of Christ may be built up. It's there in verse 13. Until we become mature. Attaining to the whole measure. The word is stature. Grown up. Of the fullness of Christ. It's there in verse 14. Then we'll no longer be infants. It's there in verse 15. We'll grow to become in every respect the mature body. And it's there in verse 16. From him 
the whole body joined, held together, grows and builds itself up in love. Well, you can't miss that, can you? It's a grown-up church that he desires, a mature church. When there isn't growth, it's tragic, isn't it? When physically or mentally or emotionally someone doesn't grow up. A man is still Peter Pan, the boy who never grew up. It's a very sad thing, isn't it? But it's equally tragic when people don't grow up spiritually. Stunted Christians, a pygmy church. And sadly in this country there are many like that. Still baby Christians, an infant church. And when Christians have been Christians for years, it's very tragic indeed. And Paul doesn't want that to happen. So he gives us three marks, at least, there's more here, but three at least marks of spiritual maturity. And conversely of immaturity. And the first mark of spiritual maturity is Christian service. Look at it in verse 12. To equip God's people for works of service. It's the same word as ministry, for works of ministry. So that the body of Christ may be built up. The mature Christian is mobilized and is serving Whereas the mark of immaturity is that they're unable to help anyone else and initially can't even help themselves. I mean, just think back. Babies. Uh, we're getting, we've been getting to know babies over the last few years. We thought we'd done it. But as soon as they are on bottle milk, we seem to have been looking after them. <laughs> Nine of them now. You have to feed them, change them, carry them everywhere, shop for them. And if you're a parent, when they're older, help them to do their homework. Well, it's all right if they're babies. But when they're 15 or 16, if you still have to do all those things for them, something has gone wrong. And it's the same with Christians. The mark of the immature Christian is that still a drone. Sorry to take the word drone lightly. <laughs> A passenger, still on the touchline, talking, taking no part in the workforce, not prayer warriors in any sort of way. Whereas the mature Christian is beavering away, always asking, how can we help? What can I do? The lack of Christian service among all the people of God is often the fault of the clergy who feel threatened by other people's ministries. Well, that is to our shame, those of us who are church leaders, if we're guilty of that. That is a terrible, terrible growth inhibitor of churches. Devastating. The role of Christian leaders is not to do all the ministry, but, what does it say here, to equip God's people for works of ministry. But somehow, and I don't know how, the church has often put what has been called a fatal comma in the middle of that phrase and read it as, the role of the leader is to equip God's people, comma, and to do the work of ministry. <laughs> Friends, there is no comma there. <laughs> Who does the work of ministry? Answer, God's people. Not any one or few ministers. In fact, calling one person the minister is a fatal mistake. And to my shame, I have to admit <coughs> that I am known, my title in our little village church is the minister in charge. Well, it's dreadful. Uh, we put a notice on our notice board in the last church, right outside on the uh, South Circular, which the church was on Battersea Rise, the South Circular, 
And it says, Mark's Battersea Rise ministers the whole congregation. Now, how does the church grow up then? End of verse 16, as each part does its work. The church has often been described as like a football match. Hundreds of people desperately in need of exercise, watching 22 people desperately in need of a rest. <laughs> now, of course, many are understandably more frail in years. And we don't, I'm beginning to include myself in this, we don't have the strength we used to. And we should only do what we can, what we're able to. And incidentally, all of us, however frail, are still able to pray. And we should do what we're able to, but one of the things I've noticed is that the very few elderly people, at least in our last church, I told you it was a church with very young people, the average age, actually, over the whole congregation was under 20, including the children, well under 20. But one of the things I noticed was that the very, among the very elderly in our last church, many instinctively wanted to serve. Now, these are real people. Graham, in his 70s, comes to the early morning prayer meeting at 7 a.m. He must have got up at 6 to get there by bus after a lifetime of service. Graham, don't you think you can sleep in? Wendy, real person, real name. Her name's Wendy, a retired vicar's wife in her 80s. She has two hip replacements. She stands for ages on end doing the coffee and washing up all Sunday morning, three services in the morning. Wendy, you were a vicar's wife for over 40 years. We've got all these young people. Can't they serve you coffee while you sit on the sofa in the hall? But you see, she can't help herself because she's a mature Christian. And she's at the early morning prayer meeting and so is her retired husband. So one mark of maturity in the church and in the individual Christian we're always looking around for what can we do. The mark of service. Uh, a second mark, I'm not actually taking these in order. The second mark is the mark of stability. Christian stability. Now look at verse 14, it's very key. Then we will be no longer infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. The mature Christian stands firm, whereas the immature one is tossed around. Now, again, this is the mark of young people, isn't it? Why so much advertising is targeted at young people? Because they can be suckers for new things, for passing fashions the latest craze. Uh, we had a huge phone bill one year. This is all a bit old-fashioned now. One of our children spent hours on the phone because she picked up a cold call message telling her she'd won a prize. She didn't realise it wasn't about a prize. It was about the phone call. She wasn't being awarded anything. She was being conned. And so many parents are understandably concerned when their child becomes a Christian. Is it just another fad? Is it the latest phase? They'll grow out of it. Um, the Marxist phase, the green phase, the vegan phase, the save the whale phrase, is the Christian phrase just another phrase? <clears throat> and they'll grow out of it one day when they finally mature. Now that was exactly what my parents thought when I became a Christian at the age of 19. In fact, because I joined the Church of England, they thought I'd fallen into a cult. <laughs> my father was very worried. 
But he didn't need to be worried that year. But if only he'd known it, he certainly might have worried ten years later when I went to theological college. <laughs> and that's when, like many others, I was tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching. And many, even Christian leaders in the church, are blown of course. And they end up no longer believing the gospel which first arrested and changed the course of their lives. Do you know this little phrase in, I think it's Paul, to Timothy, in the second letter of Timothy. He says, Timothy, continue in what you learned. Sounds rather watery thin, doesn't it? He means continue with the gospel message that you learned when you first became a Christian. I mean, I look back on how I became a Christian. I woke up on a Sunday morning, the 18th of May, 1969, without a single thought of God in my head. Indeed, I hadn't had a thought of God in my head for days, weeks, months, years, the whole of my life. I was brought up in a what I describe as a good family, but not a godly family. A good family. My parents were absolutely devoted to each other and to their four children. It was a loving, stable home. But there was no prayer. There wasn't a Bible. There was no church. I'd never been to church. There was no talk of God. To mention Jesus Christ over the lunch table would have been, I think, just slightly embarrassing. <laughs> Never knew a single Christian. But that Sunday morning, I got up without a single thought of God in my head, and that night, I had knelt by my bed and asked Jesus Christ into my life. Because I heard a gospel message. Rather badly expressed. <laughs> but it was the real one. You see, what, what Paul is saying to Timothy is, as he might say to me, Paul, if that message was enough, if it was powerful enough to take you drifting in one direction, arrest you, stop you in your tracks, turn you round and start you in a completely different direction, it was probably the right one. Continue with the one you learned. Now, a more aggressive secular atheist accusation is that Christian faith of all sorts, in general, is a childish delusion. It is infantile, and we grow out of it as part of our education. Now, many of your children and grandchildren are picking that up in school. We grow out of belief in Father Christmas and tooth fairies. So if we're to mature as individuals and as humanity, we grow out of belief in God. Belief in God is infantile. Uh, Richard Dawkins famously, in Thought for the Day over the radio, humanity can now leave the crybaby phase and finally come of age. But those who use the infantile argument have to explain why so many people discover God later in life. I mean, how many people do you know who began to believe in Father Christmas or fairies at the bottom of the garden in adulthood? <laughs> I did believe in Father Christmas until I was about five. I didn't begin to believe in God until I was 19. And those who become believers later in life certainly don't regard this as any kind of regression, perversion, or degeneration. The famous professor Anthony Flew, born in 1923, brilliant atheist philosopher, started to believe in God in his 80s. And he wrote the book, There Is 
This charge is often allied to the charge of indoctrinating children, even of brainwashing them. What Dawkins calls one of the worst forms of child abuse. But I think today you have to ask in which direction our children are being influenced in our largely secular, humanist educational system, towards faith or away from it. Uh, Benjamin Jowett, he was master of Balliol College in Oxford, talking to his goddaughter. My dear child, he said, you must believe in God in spite of what the clergy tell you. <laughs> Incidentally, uh, this is tangential off track, he also said, the greatest good in life is achieved when one's not too careful about who gets the credit. He also said, a true friend is one who knows all your flaws, but loves you anyway. And he also said, do not be afraid to go against conventional wisdom. Today he would have said, woke. Don't be afraid to go against Against conventional wisdom, it is usually wrong. Well, some Christians are immature, blown about by the latest paperback by Dan Brown, or TV program claiming the origin of Jesus and the Church, or report from the Church of England with conflicting conclusions, which Bishop should, I believe, internet article about the latest archaeological discovery. And the cults make a beeline for immature Christians on the fringes of churches. By contrast, the mature Christian develops a sense of smell. When you read a newspaper, or a religious article, or sing a hymn, or listen to a sermon, there's a discernment. Not censorious, judging people, but an awareness. Was Jesus glorified in this? Was his cross central? Was it true to his word? Was the perception of human sin realistic? Was it God-centered or man-centered? Was it with a vision of eternity or just absorbed with this life? You begin to ask those kind of questions. The immature Christian is rocked when these things come along. The mature Christian detects them and stands firm. Stability. Service. Stability. And thirdly, and I'm sorry it doesn't begin with the letter S, <laughs> Christian unity. The mature church is a church that's united. And again, this is in verses 2. I won't read them all out. Verse 2, verse 3, verse 4, verse 13, verse 16. Christians are often squabbling. They can be beastly to one another. Like children. Children are beastly to one another, aren't they? We only have to have three of our children in the same house. And they love each other. But it doesn't take long before you have to separate them. <laughs> That's mine. All that stuff. Parents have to keep telling children, I told you it would end in tears if you don't share with one another. It can continue into school and tragically beyond. If it does, it's the mark of people who haven't grown up. And one of the marks of an immature fellowship is the tendency to bad disagreement. Differences turn to rumour and gossiping and talking behind each other's backs and falling out, not speaking with one another, refusing to say sorry, reluctance to forgive, fractious, splitting into separate factions. That's the behavior of children, isn't it? So that wise and loving parents train and nurture their children out of it. One of the most important parts of their growing up, one of the most vital roles of a loving parent, 
we always used to say, the words you'll never ever have to teach your children. You'll never have to teach children these words because they will flow naturally from their lips without hesitation or any need at all for education. I, me, want, no. They will instinctively say them. But please, thank you. And you know, lots of parents stop there. You know, we're going out to another family. Say your pleases and your thank yous. And they are important. But there are two more important. Sorry. And the most difficult of all. Forgive you. Those four words will never ever come out of a child's mouth unless they are taught and nurtured into saying them. Please, thank you, sorry, forgive you. And the tragedy is when supposedly grown up Christians don't know how to say them. Now, there is good disagreement. Uh, one of our mottos in leadership, in, in over the years really, was this, I don't know where we picked it up from. Most good de decisions of a church come out of the healthy clash of ideas. Most of your best decisions come out of the healthy clash of ideas. Because unless an idea is tested, You'll never know whether it gained ownership. You'll never know how strong the bridge of that decision was unless you drive over it. There is, of course, such a thing as the unhealthy clash of ideas, and that's to be avoided at all costs. There's avoidance of discussing differing ideas. That's no good either. And most good decisions in church life are not right ones as opposed to wrong ones, but better ones as opposed to not so good ones. And that takes judgment and trial and testing and occasionally getting things wrong and lots and lots of grace and permission to fail. But as I think it was John Stott's famous dictum, disagree without becoming disagreeable. Good advice. It's when we take umbrage so easily. Some Christians are like custard. They get upset over trifles. <laughs> I thought you'd like that. Here's four little tips. Don't attack one another, address the issues. Secondly, don't assassinate people's character. Thirdly, don't attribute motive. Oh, she only says that because. He only did that because. Be very reluctant to draw conclusions about people's motives. You can't read their motives. Stick with the facts. And fourthly, don't taint by association. That's the famous trick of the media these days. So-and-so knows somebody else, and therefore they must be implicated. This is the most extreme and absurd example I can think of. Sarah visits men in prison who are there for life. Lifers are there for murder. Therefore, Sarah approves of murder. That is an absurd example of tainting by association. Don't do that. We, we do that so much more subtly. And often the connection we make, that we're tempted to make by association, is mistaken or totally ignorant.
But there's more in that chapter. But those are three quite big ones, aren't they? The marks of a grown-up Christian and of a grown-up church. Serving. Ministering to one another. Stable. And united. Shall we turn that into prayer? Would you stand again if you would like to?